Okay, well, let me begin by reading another psalm that gives to us, again, something of the heart of David, something of what he experienced because of his love for the Lord. And let me just mention at the outset, if I haven't already, that I'm, I'm not going to be dealing just with this psalm, but I'm going to be dealing with different aspects of different psalms. So there's going to be a few of them quoted, but primarily this one, and then towards the end, primarily Psalm 23. How can we not talk about Psalm 23? Uh, and we're not going to cover everything that David experienced, but just some, some examples of some of the main things, okay? Some of the main things that love will do in our hearts toward the Lord and towards others. Okay. So Psalm 63, and I chose this one mainly because of just the desire that David expresses here uh, for the Lord. And understanding a little bit of the context here, it says, this is a Psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah, and it's believed that he penned this while he was running away from Saul. Uh, Saul was trying to kill him. Again, another example of Saul's you know, lack of love for the Lord. Um, but being in the wilderness, he was separated from the different things that the Lord uses to reveal himself. And you might say from the presence of the Lord, not absolutely, but since the tabernacle was, was there, uh, you know, the, he was cut off from those symbols that the Lord, you know, uses. He, he in those days, he used various things to... Um, uh, kind of, you know, I want to say, tabernacle among men uh, in, in the tent of meeting. And I forget exactly the logistics, but being away from Jerusalem and being separated gave David this longing for God, okay, to, to be back where these different symbols of his presence were, were kept. So this is what he writes. He says, O God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. He could still do that in the wilderness. You know, God is everywhere. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Thus, I have seen you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul is satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches, for you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings, I sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek my life to destroy it will go into the depths of the earth. They will be delivered over to the power of the sword. They will be a prey for foxes, but the king will rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him will glory, for the mouths of those who speak lies will be stopped. Well, again, may the Lord bless this passage and, and the others we're going to be looking at to, uh, to our understanding and, and to our edification, to, to build us up into the image of Christ. Because remember, in any way that David is an example to us, Jesus is more so. Okay, he has this in a much greater degree and in perfection. Okay, so remember that Edwards, in his book, The Religious Affections, has been showing us that a relationship with God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is more than just a matter of head knowledge. It's more than just knowing about Jesus. It's more than just knowing the gospel. And it's more than just being convinced that those things are true. And I just want to remind you that most professing Christians today think that that is what it's all about. You, know, you, you hear it, you respond to it by going forward, praying a prayer, because you believe it to be true, but then you kind of go and live the way you want to live. Well, Edwards would tell us that is not what saving faith does. Um, a true relationship with God is a matter of the heart. It's loving the Father and the Son with the love or by the love that the Spirit of God gives to us in the new birth. Edwards would say it's a matter of the affections. It's a matter of the heart. Now, remember what Edwards said. He said affections are really desires, okay, desires that we have. And these desires are what make us choose the things we choose. Edwards also pointed out that if you were to take 
all the desire away from any, any person, if you took it away from the world, but just think about if you were devoid of any desire for anything, we would literally come to a standstill because we wouldn't want anything, we wouldn't choose anything, we'd just stand there and do nothing. Well, the same thing is true with religious affections. Religious affections are those wants or desires that we have for God, which Edwards said is really simply one, and that is love. And he says, take away that. Take away that love from our hearts. And all of our prayers, all of our praise, all of our faithfulness, all of our service to God would come to an end. We'd, we'd come to a standstill. And if we ask the question, why is it that we see people who profess to know Christ not serving Him, not worshiping Him, not doing what He calls them to do, the simple answer is they don't love Him, okay? Because you do what you want to do. They just don't want to do it. At least strongly enough, okay? We can't say they have no love, but it may not be strong enough, okay? Now, love is what made us trust in the Lord Jesus, Remember, Paul tells us that faith works by love. Love is what animates faith, gives life to it, breathes life into it, makes us want Christ, and so we trust in Him. It's what makes us choose to obey God. That's why Jesus, when He was asked by the scribe, what is the greatest commandment in the Old Testament scriptures, that, which were the scriptures in those days? Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it to love our neighbors. We love ourselves because if we love God and if we love our neighbor, we will obey the law because the law is simply how to do that. How do we love God? How do we love our neighbor? Christianity is all about love. Okay, love is why the, the Father sent His Son into the world. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Love is why Jesus came to give Himself for us, because He loved the Father, because He loved us. Love is what the Spirit of God gives us when He enters into our souls. Remember, the fruit of the Spirit is love. And that love, as Edwards argued, as we saw before, can't review everything, but that is what produces all the other fruits of the Spirit. Joy, peace, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And really, even if you hadn't heard Edward's argument, you can see that all those fruits are really just different ways in which love is applied to different circumstances. He also said that love creates hatred for sin. Because if you love what's right, then at the same time you'll hate what's wrong. So it's all about love. That's really the point of Edward's book, Religious Affection. So the next thing we want to deal with is what does that love look like? Because the, the main part of, of Edward's book, after he deals with you know, defining what Christianity is, what are religious affections, he then goes through a lengthy section on what it isn't. And uh, some of those things we'd say, well, of course it's not that, but some of those things you might look at and say, wait a minute. These are the things I was looking at in my life to say that I love the Lord. But then he gets to the end and he says, how we know that we really love the Lord, that we really have this love, that we really have these desires, is that we choose what those desires, what, what it is we're desiring, okay? We make, we make choices for God. Uh, it's not just a feeling, in other words, okay? And it's not just, again, not a conviction, it, it, it is a conviction, but it's more than that. It, and and it's, it is affection, it is love, but it's more than that. It's a love that moves us to do certain things. Now, we, again, we ask the question, what does that look like? Well, you know, Paul described it for us in 1 Corinthians 13. We looked at that before. But God has also given to us examples in Scripture. And this evening, we're going to look at the Apostle Paul and uh, I, th you know, I think just by mentioning his name, you know, it already brings up in your mind just all this activity and all this laying himself out for the Lord. Well, all of that is simply an expression of love for the Lord. This morning, we want to consider David, the man after God's own heart, and to see why 
he was a man after God's own heart. It was because he loved the Lord with such an intensity that he really did what it is that God commands us to do in, in the commandments. So what we're going to do is we're going to do, look at a few of the verses that he has written in the Psalms. And remember, Psalms are just simply songs, songs composed by David for the worship of God. And when you think about it, David composed Psalm 51 to sing in public worship. Uh, these, he laid himself open, didn't he? He exposed himself. Um, but that, that, again, is what the Lord would have us do, and we experience mercy. I mean, what, what is a testimony except you know, telling others what the Lord has done for you? And in David's case, I committed these horrible sins. Cried out to the Lord, he forgave me. And I'm here to tell you that he is a merciful and forgiving God. Now, as we read these um, verses, let's remember that David was only a human being. Okay? He wasn't superhuman. He wasn't something other than what we are, which means that his spiritual experiences are not unique to him. We, we have that same spirit. We have that same heart. So this is something we can experience, and this is something we should really strive to experience in our lives. Now, <clears throat> when we're talking about the Psalms, let's remember that even though Jesus is, you know, revealed in, in the Psalms, it, it's hard to sort out, you know, when, when it's the Father, when it's the Son. So we're going to talk about David's love for God, okay? Because God is a word that applies to all three persons, of the Godhead. They, they are all God, three persons, one God. So first of all, and again, I'm going to make these applicational points because that's what we want to draw from this. I mean, that's what we, when we go to the Psalms, that's what we go to the Psalms to do, is to figure out what am I supposed to be experiencing as a, as a believer? You know, what, what should I think of this? How, how should I respond? How can I confess my sins or how should I repent? So we're going to try to apply these things. So first of all, love will move us to put God first in our lives, at the center of our lives. And I think that's what David has in mind when he writes this, the Lord is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. Now, you know, to the Israelites, land was very important. And the portion of your inheritance, um, where the lines have fallen with regard to, um, you know, where the lines are drawn with regard to where your land is. Well, David didn't look at the land as, as that which was most important to him, but rather the fact that the Lord was his inheritance. The Lord was his portion. The Lord was the, the one who satisfied the cup from which he could drink. He says, the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage, my inheritance is beautiful to me. He considered the Lord to be beautiful, okay? And so he, he, you know, considered that to be satisfactory. He had the Lord. That's all he needed. Now, when God says in the commandments in Exodus 20, verse 30, you shall have no other gods before me, you know, this is really what he's talking about, that we put him first, that we make him the center of our lives. Jesus uh, spells that out a bit more clearly in Matthew 10, verse 37, when he said to those who would be his disciples, and remember, when he says this about himself, it also refers to the Father. Okay, there's really, you know, it's, it's again hard to separate it. We, we, we love the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, so Jesus says this, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And then he says in Luke 14, 26, to the crowds that followed him, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And then he also says, if you don't give up all your possessions, you cannot be my disciple. All right, so he doesn't mean, of course, Literally, but he does mean we must be willing, okay? Our love for him must outstrip all these other things. And these other things must be so far second that by comparison to our love for the Lord, 
they're actually hatred in comparison because we know Jesus doesn't tell us to hate father, mother, wife, children, and so forth. We don't hate our lives. Nobody ever hated his own life. Uh, we, we all love our lives. We take care of our lives, don't we? But he means by comparison, our love for him must be greater. So now think about what it would mean to put God first in our lives in this way. It would mean, and I'm just going to give a couple of examples that generally, okay, his priorities must be our priorities, okay? Pleasing him, serving him must be more important than pleasing and serving ourselves or anybody else, right? We have to do what honors him. We have to obey God rather than men. Remember how the apostles responded to the Sanhedrin that said, don't preach in the name of Christ anymore. We, we love God enough to risk our lives to do what is honoring to him because, again, we love him. And um, we're willing to honor you if you're going to command us to do what you have the right to command us to do, but you don't have the right to command us not to do what God has called us to do. Well, putting God first, this, this is what it means, to love him. Now, secondly, love will make us yearn for the Lord, okay, yearn for nearness to him. Now, we know that when we're, you know, when we don't have enough food, we haven't eaten enough food, we, we become hungry. And that hungry is kind of a yearning for food. It makes us yearn for it, doesn't it? And when we need water, we become thirsty, and that's a yearning for water. Well, it's in the same way if we yearn for God, okay, we will sense a need of him uh, as a spiritual kind of thirsting. And here we have Psalm 63, which I've already read. David writes, O oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. And really, again, think about this for a moment. What's our experience? when it comes to God's nearness? Do we have this desire, this yearning? Now, Jesus, again, said in the Beatitudes, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. What does that mean? Well, it means we, we should want to live a righteous life, to do what's right. We should want others to do that. We should want our government to do the right thing. We should want others to do the right thing. But it also means to hunger and thirst for God right? Because he is the righteous one. Uh, if, if we have this love that Jonathan Edwards talks about, this, these religious affections, remember that love is for something in particular, a love for holiness, a love for righteousness, a love for that which makes God lovely to a believer, and that is his character, his righteousness. Well, Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Well, God is the one who is righteous, so we will hunger and we will thirst for him. We will want to draw near him. And of course, then we will, okay? We will seek him because the only way we can get close to God is by seeking or by pursuing him uh, through the means that, that he's given us. And by the way, if we're his children and we don't do that, he will pursue us. And that's called discipline, okay? Uh, but we should be seeking Him, uh, to be drawing near to Him. Um, the problem is when we sense that everything's going well, we tend not to do that. It's when things get rough that we begin to seek the Lord. But we should seek Him all the time. Otherwise, He will, he will seek us. So the Lord calls us to do that. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, Psalms, uh, Psalm 27, verse 8, David writes this. He says, When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. That's, again, the heart of a, of a person who loves the Lord. They don't, you don't even need the command because you already want him. You're just waiting for him to open the gate so you can go. Well, there is no gate, okay? We're always able to come to him. And Jesus reminds us in Luke 11, verse 9, that if we do seek after him, that we will find him. I mean, what he says here with regard to prayer, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. There is nothing that will keep us from finding the Lord if we will simply seek him. Now, David 
began every day seeking the Lord. Okay, he started his day off by doing this. He says in Psalm 5, verse 3, In the morning, O Lord, you will hear my voice. In the morning, I will order my prayer to you and earnestly watch. Now, he may have been looking for a particular mercy, but David, I think, always was looking toward the Lord. You always want to see the face of God throughout the day in whatever you're doing. And when you didn't see the face of God, that is a troubling thing. And what is that face? You know, well, it's the, the face of his blessing. His countenance shines on us. Remember how the ironic blessing, the Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. When you sense the Lord's love and his nearness, okay, that's what this is. And when David didn't sense that, it was very troubling to him. He says in Psalm 13, verse 1, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? So he sought for this face. He wanted to see God's face, the, the face of his countenance, his, bless, his, you know, his, his face of blessing towards him at all times. And when he knew that it was there, it brought him the greatest joy and satisfaction. Again, I'll turn to Psalm 63, verse 3. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to be charismatic to lift up your hands, right? My soul is satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. This is how David responded when God's face of blessing was shining towards him. So, if you love the Lord, you'll want the Lord to be near, and you will be, of course, grieved when you sense that he is distant. Okay, fourthly, loving the Lord means we'll think about him all the time. Okay, love focuses our attention on the object of that love, on those whom we love. Now, David says, well, think about who he is. Well, think about what he's done. Psalm 145, verse 5, on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wonderful works, I will meditate. I want you to notice here he's using the word meditation or using the word meditate, which is more than just thinking about God. It's more of a mental examination of God, mulling him over, you know, turning him as it were, in your mind, at least what you know about him, just turning it over and over to see everything you can see about him, to sort of view him from every angle. You know, and that's what meditating on the Scripture is, is like. I mean, some have likened it to um, a cow chewing the cud, you know, getting, trying to get every drop of nutrient out of it. Uh, but that's what meditation is, thinking about it, thinking about how it applies. Uh, John Frame used to say that, Knowledge is application. You know, you may be able to memorize a verse, but you really don't know what that verse means until you can apply it. And the more you can apply it, the more you know about it. Okay, so knowledge is application, he would say. But you don't get to that kind of knowledge or application unless you meditate on it. Well, you know, we can, the same thing is true of God. Whatever the Word of God reveals about God, we need to think about those things. We need to mull them over. We need to meditate on them. So we will think about what he's done. We'll think about who he is. It also means we're going to look for the things he reveals wherever he reveals them so we can admire them, okay? And we'll do that all the time. David writes in Psalm 63, verse 6, when I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. Okay, so we'll... We'll meditate on God, and as I just said, we'll also look for Him wherever He reveals Himself. David talks a lot about seeing God's glory in the creation. Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. When He looks at the creation, especially in His day, when there weren't all the street lights, you know, and city lights and so forth, and you could look up, when you get away out into the mountains somewhere, into the desert, you look up into the night sky, it's like, wow. When I look at that, what did, what did David think when he saw that? God's majesty and his glory. He says in Psalm 8, verse 1, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. 
So when you look at the creation, you will see God. You'll see the one you love behind what, what it is that has been created. He's, he's inescapable. You can't look at these things and not see him, particularly if you love him. But that's what you'll focus on. We'll look for him also in the law of God, okay? Because the law is really an explanation of his character. You know, if, we, if I were to ask you, what is the standard by which Jesus lived? What would you say? Well, it's the law of God. And what is it that Jesus came to do to reveal the Father, to show us what he is like? Well, the law is what, he, what he's like. He loves what is good and right, okay? And that's why when we read the law of God, we'll find it to be precious, not because we'll look at it as a way by which we can be saved. Okay, that's legalism, remember? Um, if I do it, do this and you will live, that's, that's legalism, that's destroying the gospel. But there is an evangelical obedience, okay, which looks at the law and says, these things are pleasing to the one I love. And if I am to express my love to him, this is how I am to do it. If, this, if I'm going to love my neighbor, this is how I'm going to do it. So out of love for the Lord and for my neighbor, I do these things. So I'm not doing them to save myself. I am doing them to please God because I love him. And that's evangelical obedience. And that's the way David looked at the law in Psalm 19, verses 7 through 10. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. And then notice this last statement. They are more desirable than gold. Yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Edwards just saw this as an expression of that, that relish that David had because of God's grace in his soul, because of that love. He found the law of God sweet, you know, like honey to, to our taste. It's sweet to the soul and more precious than gold. And really, if, if this were true of us, if this is the way we looked at it, we would pursue this, the law of God, the wisdom of God, to be able to please God, uh, more than we would pursue the things of the world, right? And we see with, with most people today, it's the other way around, even most professing Christians. But this is what the love of God moves us to do, moves David to do, okay? Now, we'll look for the Lord in his creation, we'll look for the Lord in his law, but we'll also look for him in his people. David writes in Psalm 16, verse 3, I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good besides you. As for the saints who are in the earth, they are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. See, if we, if we love with this kind of love, we'll also love the saints, okay? We will delight in them. Why? Because they bear the image of Christ, because they bear the image of God, right? And now, seeing all these things, David will give him glory for all these things, and he says that he will tell others about it. And that's, again, why it's important for us to get together, to talk about the things of the Lord. And even just by worshiping the Lord, you know, we kind of like when David says, you know, so, uh, singing to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, we're actually singing of the glory of God and we're talking of those things to each other. David says in Psalm 9, verses 1 and 2, I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Now, lastly, let me just um, try to subsume a lot of things under one point. Love for the Lord will give us the grace to trust Him. Trusting Him is very important, okay? We need to trust Him because there's a lot of things we're going to go through in this life. And we need His grace. We need to know God is going to be true to His promises, right? So, Psalm 23, verses 1 and 2. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not 
want. Now, what does that mean except I will lack nothing? Because as my shepherd, he will take care of me. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. So what more can a sheep want? To be fed, you know, to have food and water. And Jesus says we have covering. You know, we have everything we need, don't we? Okay. Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. What, what things? Well, the things that the Gentiles eagerly seek that they put first. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? With what shall we clothe ourselves? Well, your father knows that you need these things. You need to trust, we need to trust, that he will provide these things. And if we love him, we will trust him to do this. We will trust his promise that when we fall into sin, he will lift us out of it. Remember Psalm 51. But also Psalm 23, verse 3, he restores my soul. Okay, how does our soul need, need restoring? It's when we fall out of fellowships, when we fall into sin, but the Lord brings us back. That he will direct us. Verse 3, he guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That he will be with us in the greatest difficulties we have to face. Verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. So, when his life is threatened, he wasn't afraid because God was with him and nothing could happen to him outside of the will of God. And if David were killed, what would happen to him? The Lord would take him to glory. The Lord will correct us when we go astray. Again, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod and the staff are ways in which you know, the, the shepherd made sure the sheep stayed in the right path. When they got out of, you know, out of the way... That's how he would bring them back. So when David saw the Lord's discipline, he saw that as a comforting thing. Remember what the author to the Hebrews said. If, if you don't receive discipline, of which all the children of God are partakers, then you're not children. Okay? So this is something that all of God's children experience, is God's discipline. And rather than hating it, David found it to be a, a comfort. He will vindicate us before our enemies. Verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. He will continue his love and his faithfulness, or at least we will trust that he will do this throughout our pilgrimage on earth. Verse 6, surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And we will trust that he will take us home, when his purpose for us, the mission that he sent us into the world to accomplish, and each of us has a purpose, each of us has a mission, when that's over, he's going to take us home. Verse 6, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, David's love for the Lord gave him the trust. He knew, you know, I mean, he was willing to trust the Lord. His heart, his heart reached out to the Lord. He trusted in him for these things. And he knew that God would provide them. And the way he knew was because he knew that God loved him. Whenever David refers to the Lord's loving kindness, that's what he's talking about. Loving kindness is, is a translation of one Hebrew word that refers to his covenant mercies, to everything that comes through the, um, what do you want to say, the, the promise that God made in the covenant by which he has bound himself uh, and that is to show his faithfulness and his love and his mercy to his people. David writes this in Psalm 13, verses 5 and 6, But I have trusted in your loving kindness. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Now, let me summarize all of this with a statement from Edward's Religious Affections. Um, and, and hopefully it'll be understandable. I'll, I'll try to make it as understandable as possible. If there's any w one drawback to the religious affections, maybe two, is that he doesn't think in the same way we think, so his patterns of thought sometimes can be difficult to understand. The other is he is so meticulous and he sees so much and he sees differences and these subtle nuances that you might say, well, how is this point different than this point, you know? That, that happens a lot. But 
I'm trying to give us the main thrust, uh, which is most important. But listen to what he says here. Those holy songs of David, he has there left us. And I'm not sure if he's talking about God or David, but I think God certainly has left us. Are nothing else but the expressions and breathings of devout and holy affections, such as a humble and fervent love to God, admiration of his glorious perfections and wonderful works, earnest desires, thirstings, and pantings of soul after God, delight and joy in God, a sweet and melting gratitude to God for his great goodness, a holy exaltation and triumph of soul in the favor, sufficiency, and faithfulness of God, his love to and delight in the saints, the excellent of the earth, his great delight in the word and ordinances of God, his grief for his own and others' sins, and his fervent zeal for God and against the enemies of God and his church. He said, what are all these things? But, but just the um, expression, the, the expressions and breathings of devout and holy affections. Or to put it in other terms, this is how David's love is expressed. Okay? Now again, we love the Lord. Okay? So we have these desires in our hearts as well. But again, I think we'd all have to admit, as we look at David, we all have room to grow. All of us have room to grow. And the interesting thing is, even as New Covenant believers, we have room to grow. Because there's a difference between Old Covenant believers and New Covenant believers. New Covenant believers actually have more. We have access to more of the Spirit's work. And that's considered to be the main difference between the Old Covenant saints and the New Covenant, because Jesus pours out His Spirit. And we have access to that power and that influence. But even with that, okay, I think we would say David's love still far outstrips our love for the Lord. Now, that's meant to be somewhat of a rebuke to us, isn't it? But it should be also be an encouragement, okay? Because what, again, David experienced, we can experience. So let's be encouraged by this example to seek a closer communion with God so that we can grow in this love uh, for him. And then as we do, we'll experience more of what David experienced. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us again to apply what we've heard. And let's remember too that as we pray, we should pray that the Lord would prepare us to also to come to the table, because one of the ways this love is strengthened is by remembering the love of Christ for us, but also receiving what Jesus has to give us in the Lord's Supper, which is, again, the influence of the Spirit. He's feeding us spiritually. He is stoking the love that is in our hearts for Him through the meal here. But we have to receive it by faith. We have to know it's available. We have to know where to look. We need to look to Jesus. So as we pray, let's, let's prepare to do that, um, to come to the table and to receive what he has for us.